to identify yourself and your affiliation. Hi, good morning. I'm Rich Wong with the Maritime Administration. Uh, there's a question that ties a little bit of what you've all said to something that is of concern to, I know, us and other of the trade agencies. <clears throat> is this, when you talk about the disconnect between the 5Gs and the nation states and where do we invest properly and how do we adapt, um, I know many agencies are sort of looking at the China One Belt One Road policy where they're sort of doing a dual approach of looking at 5G but also doing as a national investment to the tune of, by our estimate, something, something over a trillion dollars at this point into a global trade network that can also make all of these investments, but you're not seeing a parallel investment in the traditional G7, G20, excluding China, G20 countries. So are there avenues, perhaps, where we see this? And I know from maritime administration, uh, for what it's worth, the US has only 78 ships that operate in the international fleet. So, and most of that is through government business. And so it's trying to see, well, where are there even openings now, admittedly, we move goods, but where are there p potential avenues for harmonizing the nation-state investment versus the 5G investment? Interesting, Greg. I'll turn it to the panel. That's a good one for me, but I'm not sure I have an answer. <laughs> Is, uh, yeah, I'm not sure, to be honest, that I really understand your question. I mean, the, the, the Chinese ambitions are daunting. And, you know, I think it has probably more to do with how China sees itself and its role in the world than it does with even economics, although certainly the economics of it are strong. So I'm not sure it's really a trade agenda so much as a, a uh, sort of strategic agenda of their role, how they see their role in the world. And how we respond to it, I think. So it, it could be construed narrowly. I mean, it, as a foreign policy geopolitical problem. And how the West, I'm not, I'm not sure where I'm going with this, but the, how the West responds to China, I think is a, it's obvious to everyone that this is a, really a major issue. I'm not, and again, I'm not sure it's about trade, and I'm not sure it's about, you know, it's about everything, because it is, it's such a vast country. It's so obviously important to every dimension of human life, as you think about the future. So, and the 5Gs, I mean, I think, you know, the Chinese talk a lot about innovation, and I think it wouldn't surprise me that, you know, the 5G thing, I'm not sure, I don't think if you were in a Chinese audience, policy audience, or expert audience, I don't think they'd be surprised by the 5Gs. And, I mean, there are more mega cities in China probably than any other nation in the world, for sure, even now, much less in the future. So, so I'm not sure these are dichotomous agendas, and I think they're sort of, force fields that are both going forward together. One's a little more infrastructure investment, the other's more social forces and um, institutional processes. But I think the history's gonna be made by both, and I'm not sure how to crosswalk two things, to be honest. So that's some of the thoughts. Anybody else? One, one interesting wrinkle in the data, which is absolutely fascinating, is if you cut the data by Confucian versus non-Confucian societies, uh, big differences uh, in how the populations view um, authority of government, of business, and um, are more supportive of um, you know large top-down solutions. And I think that's I think that's part of just uh, you know we don't talk about culture very often, but it's just a part of the world's culture how it works. I think that the one last piece is the difference in how we think about timelines and time, their ability to think out several centuries, <laughs> and we're able to think out in quarters. <laughs> it makes a huge huge difference in how they invest and how they think about rings of influence. Um, and their ability to go think about where are going to be the water supplies, where are going to be key minerals, where are going to be key places for building, uh, for, for having food. Uh, they're buying it up. <laughs> and they have not a lot of strings attached to it um, because they know they're going to need it. Not for their current generation, but 100 years from now or 200 or 300 years from now. Um, so I just think we have very different 
um, ways of thinking about spheres of influence and short-term, long-term impact that are making now, but more importantly in the future, going to have huge, huge, huge implications for trade because they've already signed, they've already kind of finalized the deals and we have no idea really what's happening. It's know, pretty significant. For, for what it's worth, I don't know for what it's worth, I know our agency and possibly some others recognize the, the impact and potential of that long-term investment. And it's, yeah, as I, you know, when I ask about the harmonization of how do you then start to um, approach this from both the government and policy standpoint of, of thinking longer term, even though, for instance, I don't know if I'll be showing up for work on Monday morning <laughs> because of the uh, one week spending bills, so things like that. Very good. Other questions? I think I saw a hand. Barbara Bowie Whitman. You touched in the uh, overall presentation of attitudes on the fact that developed markets and uh, developing or emerging markets had different attitudes toward movement of people. And that really comes back to the the key crux of all of this, because attitudes toward trade have, those that have gone negative, have to do with saying, other people are coming in here and they're competing with me. We experienced this when we were negotiating the free trade area of the Americas, which never came to be, because there were those in Latin America, aside from the things that they were afraid we might impose upon them, there were those in Latin America who believed that what we were talking about was integration. Integration meaning free movement of the factors of production, not just including capital, but including people. And uh, what you see in both Brexit and in the idea that some of our trade agreements aren't what they ought to be, and in the scolding that USTR took while doing the um, agreements with Central America about you may not expand visas under a trade agreement because that's not trade. That's immigration. And your scope has nothing to do with immigration. So our resistance and the British resistance, because they are facing the same thing vis-a-vis -vis Europe about, yeah, we like your goods and we want to sell you our goods, but we don't want your people. And, and that's what we're facing in terms of negative attitudes toward trade in this country. We want goods, ideas are fine, we don't want to trade people. And that comes back to everything you've talked about, just addressing how you deal with the concepts of whether we are talking about trade or whether you're talking about a concept where everybody can go wherever they want, which is what a lot of people in this country don't want right now. Well, you know, when you look at the data, it's um, in the developed nations, especially Western Europe and the US, the few on um, you know population flows was 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 not popular, and um, you know you do you just see this as a political impulse of all around uh, developed uh, nations right now as something. Um, the interesting thing that I to think through is you know that's what the world looks like right now. You could have some kind of pandemic or something like this that would even exacerbate that uh, further. Or, you know, you could have collapse because um, you don't get uh, human, you know, flows of people for tourist reasons and it hurts the tourist economy like in Florida. So I think there's, you know, we can, any survey is a snapshot in time uh, and it's a photograph of what's happening at that moment and that's what we have. But there are things that could happen that could change it either way. Uh, in the near term, and I think Josh has raised the interesting notion that, you know, now that you have a Trump administration and you have people reacting against the Trump administration just as people reacted against the Obama administration, you get spikes in support for the thing that the, the administration is supposedly against. Supposedly against. So um, it remains to be seen. Uh, other questions? Shannon Gaffney with DAI. Thank you so much for this fascinating conversation. I had a question that's related to the slide that we're all looking at right now. And I wondered when you talked about 
Stanley and the Sophia. And I thought it was really interesting talking about we're really kind of hyper focused on the Stanleys and potentially, especially in this country, appealing to the Stanleys for the 2018 election. Um, but we really should be thinking in the long term about the Sophias, among others, that are kind of more prevalent throughout the world. So, what do you think the dangers or the implications are of sort of a hyper polarized media focusing so much on the Stanleys when it's really a much broader and richer picture? Well, you know, so we conducted this research as a firm because we had a concern, and the concern was that we were all, at some level, living in our own uh, bubbles. Uh, our clients are corporations. So our concern was is that if our clients wanted to better think about the world and then communicate with the world, that we would need to think about all the different segments of the population. And so our operating theory on this was just how can we learn more about, about different views of the world and how could we sort of showcase that so we can pressure test what we're doing and what, what our clients are doing and what our clients are saying around the world. Um, and there's so many interesting um, tidbits when you, when you look at this. Um, you know, we in the United States. So just to, in the United States, we think about the world in terms of the, the generations that that we we created generational frames, right? So we have the Boomers, we have the Xers, we have the Millennials. Silent generation is now retired, but silent generation as well. Um, and that's how we've thought about generations. But in Great Britain, for example, the Boomers start a little bit later because of austerity at the end of. Two. In South Africa, generations are thought of differently because there's the born free generation after apartheid. So, and then there's the, the folks in China who are born after the Cultural Revolution. So, you know, we have a generational matrix that we use to think about the world that doesn't necessarily apply. But if you go and you look at to other nations, but if you go and you look at our 48 faces, some of the, you immediately start to think about the world from their perspective. And I think it's incredibly. It's incredibly healthy to think about, you know, how would a middle-aged person in an emerging market that's in a rural area who is a dad react to some of this, some of this stuff? There are some interesting points here too. You know, we asked people how much they sort of trusted different, or how how much progress they thought different types of institutions were making, and sometimes in the world you see more or less trust, for example, in the military or in religious institutions. And it gives you a sense of how, well, in some level, unsafe the world um, actually is. Well, I'll turn it So I'll just briefly, uh, I, I found this fascinating and I want to see the background because, because we do tend to focus on the SOFIA. And the reason why is because our corporate members, similar to what you were saying, represent the largest companies in the world in their industry sector. They spend collectively, just our members, over a trillion dollars a year on products and services. And does anyone in the room know how much of that goes to women in businesses, to Sophia's? Any idea? Out of a trillion dollars, what percent might go to women owned businesses? They make up half the population, they're a third of the private businesses, they make over 70% of the consumer purchasing decisions. 1%. 1%. That's bad business. If you're trying to grow your company, increase sales, anticipate the needs of your customers, you have to engage those end users. And you have to demonstrate a commitment to, the, to those communities. And so I think when you talk about trade, we have to look at value chains and how money flows. And frankly, women own almost none of the world's assets in a world that's totally based on asset-based lending. So it's a non-starter for the Sophias of the world to get engaged. It's really, really hard. But we have to work together to figure out how to do this because we will all be better off if the men and the women have an equal opportunity to participate in trade and in business and in growth and in innovation um, and to making sure all of our kids are smart and healthy and happy and well-educated. So it's in all of our collective interest to make sure that as we talk about the realities um, and where we want to be, how do we address those challenges effectively and together? Uh, and I would just add, I don't, I don't think it's an either or proposition. I don't think you have to focus on, there, there aren't policies that can unite Stanley and Sophia. 
infrastructure was a big, talk, much talked about possibility um, for President Trump here in the U.S. and that would have united sort of the blue collar base that switched over to vote for him in this election and, and, and the support of a lot of Democratic voters who like the construction projects and actually think it could stimulate the economy. Um, that wasn't chosen, that wasn't the path that this administration chose, but there are plenty of issues that can unite the, the two coalitions. It's actually not as black and white as, as you might think at first, uh, at least in the United States. I think the thing that was, that's been most, there's been so many things that have been encouraging to me when we've been sharing this uh, data and the findings with clients of the media, et cetera, and one of the most encouraging things, at least to me, is the reaction from journalists. Um, and it's been incredibly healthy. You know, we've shared this with a lot of journalists, and they've said a couple of things. One is, we do all need to get out of our bubbles. Great journalism helps people get out outside of their comfort zone and helps them see the world through totally different perspectives and helps them understand the stories of other people. And the thing that journalists really latched onto was, what are the, how could we better tell the stories of all of these people? You know, journalists do every day. I mean, you know, and they, they go out and interview people on the street every day. But how do you tell these stories? And there's some fascinating stories. I just, just to close up, Omar. So Omar is 50, in his segment, older men, no college degree, emerging market, urban, very large city. You know, he's, interestingly enough, he's one of the most negatively, um, he's one of the, the groups that's most negative towards the concept of socialism, interestingly enough, which is um, interesting for somebody like Modi, right, uh, in India, right? So he just, his segment, interestingly enough, just does not think that an, an idea that was created in Europe in the 1800s is going to work for him in an emerging market in the 21st century. And that is a fascinating finding and something that journalists can investigate. I think, I think uh, the reaction then from journalists has been really exciting. How do we tell those stories? How do we go out and meet Shreya, who's one of our segments? What's her story like? You know, and so I think you're going to see a lot more of that. And that, to me, is uh, exciting. Thank you, uh, uh, Robert, uh, Elizabeth, Colin, Josh. Uh, really, uh, absolutely fascinating conversation. Uh, we are I'm thrilled to, to have hosted this discussion, and I think there was just so much more. As Colin said to me, he could do this in 100 minutes or 10 minutes. Um, I, I wanted more from all of you. Um, uh, I'm privileged to, to count Robert as a friend, and I get to hear this a, a lot. We actually were uh, talking over lunch the other day, and I had mentioned about um, I met a, uh, a man uh, so a few years ago, worked for a German company. Was if you find this interesting, his job description is a futurist. And, and his job is to look 20 and 30 years into the future uh, of what their business is going to look like. And, and at the time, I, I, could, I almost couldn't get my arms around that, because I'm coming from an American context where you're thinking of quarters. The idea, now this was a privately held company, so I think it was a little bit easier, but um, I think we, we that's, this is the direction we're trying to go with WIDA. At the same time we're hosting this conversation about what's happening right now, we need to be looking into the future. Um, I was actually an elevator operator once. Um, one of my first jobs when I was in college, uh, I actually did run an elevator. That those I've gone by that old building in the Fashion District in New York, and they are not there anymore. Um, and uh, but hopefully, I think uh, I don't know what happened to the old the, the folks I was doing that with. It, it was all generations at the time. This is 30 years ago. Um, but there are a lot of changes happening. Um, I, I did find this quote I was mentioning earlier. Uh, Secretary Mnuchin uh, last month said that uh, artificial intelligence uh, won't be displacing U.S. jobs for at least the next 50 to 100 years. Um, I think that so far in the future, in terms of artificial intelligence taking American jobs, I think we're like way away from that, not even on my radar screen. So hopefully uh, that's changed. Um, I think our radar screen here, we, we know we're going to talk about the fact that there was a lot of changes happening. Um, or, or I think this, this series on global value change, we want to try to look at that, look at wh where we're headed uh, uh, as a society, uh, for work, I think looking at the whole person and, and all of society and how that all fits together with the trade agenda that we're talking about is critical. So thank you all very much. Thank you all for coming. I hope you come to the next events in this series as we look at some of these things like uh, uh, global value change start, uh, starting next week on May 3rd. Thanks.